If you struggle with psychosomatic illness, or if you know someone with psychosomatic illness, oftentimes we have this idea that you're, they're doing it for attention. Or people will judge you and say, you are doing it for attention. You keep on having a stomach ache and you're doing it for attention and it's not real. And it pisses off people around you. They're super judgmental. Or if you're on the receiving end of having a loved one with a psychosomatic illness, you get pissed at them. And you're like, fucking A. Like, on my wedding day, you have to have your GI problems again. There's this idea that we do it for attention. Okay? That is also basically not true. There's some truth to that, but it's not the way that we think. So what we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years about psychosomatic illness is revolutionary. And the basic problem is that physicians are not trained in this, okay? So what do we mean by psychosomatic? That means there is a psychological component and there is a physical component. And what we're going to learn today is that the way that our system of medicine, like Western medicine, is set up is very, very bad at treating psychosomatic illness, so I'll give you all a simple example. So if you've got a psychosomatic illness called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, you may get referred by your general practitioner or primary care physicians to a cardiologist. And a cardiologist is like, yeah, maybe I can give you some medicine, but what you need to do is you need to go see a therapist. And then you get referred by a psychologist and a psychologist will do psychotherapy on you, but the psychologist doesn't understand the, like the cardiovascular component of it. So what we've happened, what we've managed to do in our system of medicine is we send you to two different specialists, each of whom knows their particular thing, but doesn't understand how these things are all connected. So we do a very bad job in Western medicine of treating psychosomatic illness because, like, for example, POTS is associated, 44% of people with POTS in one study have a history of sexual abuse or physical abuse, Okay. Now, if, the, if you go to the cardiologist, what is the cardiologist going to say? They're going to say, okay, like, go see a therapist for that piece, and I will handle this stuff. So if you go to a psychologist, we also know that there are dysregulations, we'll get, go into what POT is, with your, like, cardiovascular system, right? And the psychologist doesn't know anything about that, so then they send you to the cardiologist. So these are both parts of the disease, but, like, you can't treat them in isolation. So today what we're going to do is we're going to explain to you all where psychosomatic illness comes from. We're going to like understand how our mind and our body is a homeostatic unit. What does that mean? So if my blood pressure drops, it is detected by receptors in my throat, basically. You know, like when people do like choke holds and they like make people pass out during like these like spy movies, they're not, they're not actually cutting off oxygen flow. They're actually squeezing both of your carotid baroreceptors and inducing a blood pressure drop, which makes you pass out, okay? So we detect blood pressure up here. And when our blood pressure drops, these things send signals to our heart. Let's pump harder, baby. They also send signals to our kidneys. Let's absorb more volume. Let's absorb water. Because if you have a closed circuit, like a pipe, right, like a blood vessel, and the pressure is low, what can we do to increase the pressure? We can squeeze... Okay, we can go from here to here. This will increase the pressure and we can increase the volume on the inside. Both of these things will increase our blood pressure. So the body works as a whole system. The biggest problem that we have in Western medicine is we have separated the mind from all the other organs. So today we're going to understand that the mind is no different from any of the other organs. And if you really want to get a good handle on psychosomatic illness, you have to understand how all these things combine. Now, this is very important for y'all to understand because I hate to break it to you, but very few, even medical doctors or psychologists will understand this level of like thing about psychosomatic illness. Because what do we do in our system of medicine? We have specialists, right? So I'm going to become an expert in the heart. But as I learn more and more about the heart, like I don't know so much about healing trauma. And if I'm a psychologist, like I don't even get like a single hour of medical training on how the heart functions. So what happens when there is a disease that is not localized to one organ system? What happens when you have a disease that the disease is not in one piece, but is in the way that all of the units of your body connect to each other? And that's where psychosomatic illness exists. So unfortunately, you're going to have to become an expert in this. If you have a psychosomatic illness, you have to be the expert. Because very few medical doctors or psychologists or therapists 
will like have the multidisciplinary perspective that it takes. And my goal today is over the next hour, I want to make you an expert in your own psychosomatic illness. So let's start by understanding what do I mean by psychosomatic illness? So we're talking about illnesses like irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, fibromyalgia, which is like a pain syndrome, POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, okay? We're going to go over the basics of psychosomatic illness, and then we're going to use these three examples to illustrate certain points. But there are all kinds of other psychosomatic illnesses, functional GI disorders like functional dyspepsia, you know, gastric dysmotility disorder. There's all kinds of other stuff like chronic fatigue syndrome, um, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. There's just like all kinds of like GI stuff, skin stuff. It's like whole body kind of stuff, okay? So there's a ton of diseases that this lecture applies to. And we're going to dive into three of them to illustrate those general concepts. So let's start with the origins of psychosomatic illness. So what causes a psychosomatic illness? So back in the day, Freud made a observation. And Janet, I think, also made this observation on a psychosomatic illness. And what they essentially discovered is that there appears to be a psychological component to someone's physical manifestations. So Freud was looking specifically at menses and menstruation and really bad, like, menstrual pain. Janet was looking at other things. But what these two people basically discovered is that people who are, have a psychosomatic illness bypass a part of their mind. And, and what they sort of discovered is that the mind is capable of splitting itself in two. And then like the more we bypass our mind, the more somatic problems we tend to have. Okay. Now this has been borne out later in, in other kinds of research like trauma. So we know, for example, that people who are traumatized early in life one of the six domains of their body, mind, life that is affected is increased somatic complaints. So if you go through a psychological trauma, like even something like emotional abuse, you are more likely to have random problems in your body. So Freud and Janet both sort of discovered this kind of principle. Now, they also made a couple of different, they had a couple of different ideas behind it. So Freud thought that the nature of the subconscious problem symbolically manifests in the body. So for example, like the kind of psychological thing that happened results in a certain like bodily complaint. So if, for example, I feel like my parents are suffocating me because they don't let me pursue my dreams, then I'll have some kind of like lung complaint and I can't breathe. So that's what Freud thought. I don't really put too much stock into that. But Janae also sort of figured out that, like, there's some problem with emotional suppression and the increase in our somatic complaints. And what we basically discovered is that alexithymia, which is the inability to determine your internal emotional state, correlates with somatic problems in life. And let's understand how that works. So here's what happens. Anytime we have a stress, the stress first hits our mind. And then our mind activates in particular ways. So we will release cortisol. We will activate our immune system. We will activate our nervous system. So this is things like adrenaline, right? And then these all will cascade into the body. And we will experience symptoms. So here's what the early, like, kind of psychoanalysts, and later on we sort of discovered this. If you numb this, so let's say I put this into a black box where I have no awareness, no emotional awareness of what's going on, this basically goes straight into cortisol, whatever, and it kind of gets, it like passes straight through, right? So we're not aware. So the first thing is that, the first thing to understand about psychosomatic illness is in my experience, People with psychosomatic uh, somatic illness do not have a weak mind. They actually have a very strong mind. Even to the point that their mind is able of, to persevere and continue pushing you to the point where your body starts to break down. So if we think about, you know, how does illness emerge in the body? It's basically the weakest link. And when someone's mind is stronger than their body, you can force your body to keep moving forward even though it is sending you signals. Hey, we're hurting. Hey, this is a problem. Hey, we're getting screwed. 
And your mind is like so strong that you power through. And when you power through, you actually result in some part of your body starting to get screwed up because your mind is like a taskmaster and it whips forward. Whip, 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 whip. So I became somewhat of an expert in psychosomatic illness. And how did I become an expert in psychosomatic illness? Well, when I was in my fourth year of training at, at Mass General Hospital in Harvard Medical School, I started a consult service that was a complementary and alternative medicine evidence-based consult service. So I started getting patients originally from psychiatrists. But then what happened is primary care physicians or GPs started sending me patients. And they're like, hey, this person has IBS or this other crap that I can't give them a medi medication and make it go away. So let me send them to you. And then I started doing really well with those patients. I got more and more referrals for like IBS and POTS and fibromyalgia and all this kind of crap. And then as I started working with these people, I started figuring out. So the first thing that I realized is I know what mental illness is, right? I'm a freaking psychiatrist. And since I know what mental illness is, the first thing that I realized working with IBS patients is these people are not mentally ill. I know what that looks like, right? That even if I treat their anxiety, that I can treat their anxiety and I know I'm doing a good job because there's tons of evidence for it and their symptoms are still continuing. Ergo, this is not something in their mind. And what I actually discovered is that these people are actually very mentally strong. They're not mentally weak. In fact, they are too mentally strong. So what they end up doing is powering through, overcoming some physical signals and are not as emotionally aware as they need to be. Okay, so now let's understand something else. So this is normally how stress happens, right? We get, it goes through our mind and then it gets passed through our body. And we also know that these people are alexithymic. Psychosomatic illness has an association with trauma. Okay, some studies show up to 44% of people have been physically or sexually abused. So what's happening in the mind with trauma? These both, both of these things are going to be similar to dissociation. Okay. So when we don't have awareness in our mind, either from our emotions and being alexithymic or trauma and dissociation, which this means is that the, the stress just passes through. Now let's look at what happens in a normal situation. Okay, now our mind is a really good filtering mechanism. So if I get some kind of stress, someone says, hey, uh, like, you know, I'm sorry, I can't pick you up from the airport. I got a flat tire. Now, normally what the mind can do anytime there's a stress is we can modulate that stress. We can use coping mechanisms. We can think things through. We can take a deep breath and we can say, okay, hold on a second. Am I actually as screwed as I think I am? Let me utilize my mind to modulate our stress. And so even if there is a big stress signal coming in, big ass stress signal, I can use my mind to tone it down. And then the stress experienced by my body is smaller. Does this make sense? Y'all get this? So this is normally what happens when you get stressed out, right? If you're at, like, if you're in a healthy state of mind, you can modulate the stress that goes into your body. The problem with psychosomatic illness is that this step is taken out. Now, does this mean that the mind controls the illness? No. There's actually all kinds of stuff going on here that is completely legit and real. It is not in your mind. But the problem in psychosomatic illness is that we're, we kind of we bypass the mind in some way. There's a part of our mind that keeps on whipping us forward and actually increases the stress on the body. But there's real stress in the body as well. well. We'll kind of get to that, okay? So the first thing that we've got to do, and we'll get to this later, is we have to sort of fix our mind's ability to modulate the outside stress, which is real, and the physiologic response, which is real. The second thing that we kind of know from people with psychosomatic illness is that they are very externalizing. Now, what does this mean? So if you're struggling with psychosomatic illness and there is a problem, where do problems get fixed? Do they get fixed within you or do they get fixed outside of you? Now, if I ask this question, 
This is going to be a stupid question for most of y'all, or half of y'all. Half of y'all are going to say, well, like, obviously, if there's a problem on the outside, the solution is on the outside. This means that you are externalizing. I know it sounds kind of crazy, and what I'm about to say to you is not going to make any sense. Because the entirety of your experience has taught you that this is not true. Which is external problems do not have internal solutions. That needs to change. I know it's crazy. But you're saying, but Dr. K, aren't you saying that there is some real physiology at play? I'm saying, yes, there is real physiology at play, and that solution actually exists within you. I know it sounds weird, but this is what we know. When people grow up in a social situation, sometimes they grow up in a social situation where parents teach them that problems require external solutions. Okay, this is just how, how you were raised. So when mom and dad had a problem, did they fix it by like doing something external? So there's a good evidence, for example, that shows that when a child has a GI complaint and some, some parents take them to the doctor, let's say 10% of the time. Some parents take them to the doctor 50% of the time and some parents take them to the doctor 90% of the time. This is the category that ends up with children with psychosomatic illness. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that it's in your head? No. This means that your parents taught you that when you feel bad on the inside, the solution is to go fix something on the outside. GI is gastrointestinal. Okay? So like when a kid says, like, my stomach, my tummy hurts. Right. And so, like, if you think about what a lot of parents will do, a lot of parents will say, well, you know, I know it's the first day of school. I know your tummy hurts. Maybe there's a psychological component to it. There's a physiological component to it as well, by the way. But the way that they manage that is they kind of like emotionally support you. So another thing that we tend to find from a social standpoint is that people who are socially supported have improvements in psychosomatic illness. Okay? Now, people will also reverse engineer to this. They say, well, if you're socially supported, doesn't that mean that it's all in your head? Once again, no. You can have patients with metastatic cancer whose survival rate, I'm sure some study out there will show. I haven't looked at this like stage four cancer and social support. But social support helps people recover from strokes. It helps people recover from myocardial infarctions. It helps people survive cancer. So once again, just because social support is important doesn't mean that it is all in your head. But what we know from people with psychosomatic illness is that when they grow up, they are taught that if I have an internal problem, it requires an external solution. OK, they also have parents who will be like, you know, if you're if you get frustrated, like if you try to share your emotions with your parents. What do your parents do? Your parents will tell you to do something about it, right? The kids are bullying me at school. Go sign up for martial arts class and kick their ass the next time they bully you. That an internal problem requires an externalizing solution. So what does this mean? Does this but the parent doesn't say. You know, sit down and say, hey, like, I'm sorry they're bullying you. I love you. You're a great person. You'll be okay. Do you want to sign up for martial arts class? Would that help you feel more confident? Do you all understand how those are two very different things? Like, in one case, parents will literally tell you that any problem that you have, if you feel a certain way, you need to change something outside of you. And if you change something outside of you, that will change the way that you feel. Okay? Okay. So this is what happens with kids who grow up. They have parents like this that are very externalizing, okay? So this is a core part of psychosomatic illness. So main thing to keep in mind is that our mind has the ability to modulate stress on our body. And that people who grow up with psychosomatic illness are raised in a particular environment where this step is actually removed for them in some kind of way. And this is not just removed from them. This is not just removed from them from from a, a just an emotional uh, support standpoint. There are also issues of trauma and dissociation where you are like kind of not 
you're literally dissociating. You're fracturing your consciousness into two parts and you're burying one. And the result is that the stress bypasses your mind and goes straight into the body. So we're going to talk about IBS, all right? So in IBS, which is known as irritable bowel syndrome, what this means is that your bowels are irritable. It's characterized by alternating diarrhea, constipation, nausea, bloating, not too much vomiting usually. Usually it's just like nausea and bloating. But it's really confusing because when we think about it from like a Western medicine standpoint, we know that there's some things that are constipating and some things that cause diarrhea, right? They're absolutely like an infection can cause diarrhea. And if you are hopped up on opiates, you'll get constipated. We'll also know that diet, for example, can cause constipation. But the thing about IBS is that like, their GI system is just kind of screwed. Like sometimes they, they're constipated. Sometimes they have diarrhea. They're kind of bloated all the time. And there's not like a medication that we can give that will like fix that, right? We have medications for diarrhea. You can give like loperamide. And we have medications for constipation, right? So you can give people things that are like, will have them poop. And you can even do things like enemas and whatever. We can increase their fiber, increase their fluid intake. But we don't know like when the, when the bowel is doing both, like we're not sure what medication to give. So what happens in IBS, so this is what IBS is, okay? So it's like just all these weird GI problems that don't have a particular smoking gun. So what do we know about IBS? So first thing that we know is that uh, 15 to 30% of people with IBS have a history of abuse. One study showed that 44% of people have been sexually or physically abused who have IBS. Now let's understand what is that, does that mean it's psychological? No, not at all. So what we also know is that people with IBS have a hypersensitivity or over, uh, uh, sorry, an increased amount of adrenaline or noradrenaline. So even if you look at their genetics, these are people that have a hypersensitivity or have too much adrenaline basically in their body. Okay. So what does this mean? How does this fit together? So if you get traumatized early in life, your body rewires. And how does it rewire? So if you get traumatized early in life, when you get traumatized, your, your body experiences a lot of danger, right? So since it experiences a lot of danger, the danger machinery in your body gets leveled up, right? So if I go and I like lift weights, I'm going to grow my muscles. If I go and like, you know, I have to, if I have to memorize a bunch of stuff for medical school, then like my memory capacity will increase. If I get fucking abused, then my sympathetic nervous system, my fight or flight system, my adrenaline system will actually level up and we'll, we will get more sensitive to adrenaline. So there are studies that show that people with IBS have a hyperactive adrenaline and stress system. And so what that means is that things that would normally not stress people out, since you have a hyperactive stress system, normal things will create a disproportionate physiologic response. So we get adrenaline secreted way more often. We get it secreted way earlier. And why is that? It's because we've been hypersensitized, right? Because we grew up in traumatic environments and we're like, for danger, our, our ability to detect danger increases. Our response to danger increases. Why? Because that's a survival mechanism. But at this point, we've fully, we've jumped beyond the mind. This has nothing to do with your mind. This has to do with the wiring of your nervous system has altered at this point. And by the way, which psychiatric illness is associated with hyperactivation of our danger circuitry? Can anyone guess? anxiety. And guess which mental illness is most common in people with IBS? It is anxiety. So these are cases where if we look at what happens in anxiety, we, you have a hypersensitivity to your stress system. Okay? Now, another thing that we know in people with IBS is that they also have this emotional numbing going on. So how do we put these two pieces together? If my body has been wired to be very sensitive to stress and release way too much adrenaline. And by the way, really what it is, is, is reductions in reuptake 
of adrenaline. So that's not way too much. What that means is that the adrenaline signal lasts way longer in IBS than it does in a healthy person. And this is why they have these like weird kind of symptoms. Okay. So it's not that they like go into panic attacks. It's that their body is in a high stress state for a very long period of time, which can even do things like result in, in diarrhea. Okay. So you have a hyperactivation of your nervous system. So let's go back to this. So what do we know about people with IBS? They have a hyperactivation of sympathetic nervous system. So this is adrenaline and noradrenaline. And specifically what this is, is a reduction in reuptake of noradrenaline. And what does that mean? Okay, so I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of technical stuff, but I hate to say this, like y'all got to learn this, right? So like stick with us for a while. We're going to reinforce these concepts a couple of times, but it's very important to understand. So this isn't too much adrenaline. What this means is that when we release adrenaline, reuptake is slowed down. So this is our stress experience for someone who has IBS. This is how we're physiologically wired, okay? So then the other thing that happens is if we have large amounts of adrenaline in our body for prolonged periods of time, what do you think that does to our mind? It makes us more anxious. And then the other thing that it, it does is it causes us to catastrophize. So this is something that's very important to understand about all psychosomatic illnesses. So, when we feel something in our body, and when we learn to externalize, what this ends up as, and if you've got psychosomatic uh, somatic illness, you understand this, you will catastrophize the impact of this. So what that means is, I'm starting to feel rumbling in my stomach, this means I need to leave the party because I'm about to get fucked. The rumbling in the stomach means I'm GG'd out. And why do they do this? What's going on here? There's all kinds of really interesting things. So when we have adrenaline in the brain, one function of adrenaline in the brain is that it makes hypothetical problems feel more real. Okay, now let's understand this for a second. If I'm walking in my house and I see, I don't know, a fucking garden hose in my laundry room and I don't see it very clearly, and adrenaline is pumping. I'm going to see a garden hose and I'm going to think it is a snake. That possibility of danger feels more real. And I jump and I scream. And I go jump into my wife's arms and she holds me and pats me and com comforts me. Right? So what adrenaline literally does in the brain is it makes possible things feel more real. Okay? So now let's... let's if we have adrenaline in the brain, which, by the way, we know that genetically people with IBS have more adrenaline floating around all over the place. We'll get to why their adrenaline is even higher for other reasons in, in a minute. And then that adrenaline goes to our body. What does that mean? That, that causes us to catastrophize. Okay? As we catastrophize, and there's also some good data for this, right? So internally, like I've, I had a patient once that <clears throat> had IBS that literally like shat themselves on their honeymoon. And, like, that's not a psychological cry for attention or any of that other crap. doesn't mean that they're mentally weak or whatever. They're like, yay, I'm getting married. This is going to be great. And I shot myself. And now this is embarrassing. And I'm married to this person. And, like, what they, they like, help their spouse help clean themselves up. Like, there's no, you cannot tell me that this is some fucking psychological cry for help or attention or whatever. Right? So I worked with this person. I'm like, that's not what's going on. That, that's just, it's just not what's going on. Okay. So what happens with people with IBS is that they have genuine bad outcomes plus this adrenaline thing, which causes them to catastrophize. As they catastrophize, they start doing something called behavioral amplification, which is the second I feel something in my body, I'm going to alter my behavior. So the second I feel a rumbling, I'm going to leave dinner. The second I feel a rumbling, I'm going to walk out of the movie theater because bad things can happen. Okay? So this is a psychological consequence. This, in turn, leads to social isolation. And then it all kind of fits back together and it becomes a clusterfuck. 
So there's also a couple of other things that we know in IBS. So this is hyperactivation. This is number one. Y'all with me? Or is that like two all over the place? Give up time. Well said. Second thing that happens in IBS is that we have changes to our immune system. Okay? So we get an increase in enterochromaffin activity. We also see increased mast cell activity. So what this basically means is like our allergy response, like the, the part of our immune system that governs allergies is basically hyperactive. So we basically have like our gut becomes, gut has an allergic response. And that's why we get like diarrhea and bloating and all this like non-specific stuff. It's not that we have an infection that can be localized to one area. It's not like there's one part of our, you know, gut that's messed up. We don't have like a loose gastroesophageal sphincter, which causes reflux. There's not one problem. Our whole gut is like hypersensitive due to a couple of these changes, which means that like it's easy to trigger it into like going down a cascade of crap. Okay. Third thing is that there is a brain-gut connection. There's like way more than three. There's like 15, but we're going to explain a couple of the others later, okay? I'm going to spoon feed y'all. So what we know is that gut microbiome and this allergic GI system causes immune activation, okay? And then the other thing that starts to happen is that we also see changes from this kind of stuff in visceral sensory input. Okay? So now what does this mean? So we have nerves in our belly that tell us stuff about our belly. This is when we like, you know, when you feel full after eating a lot, like what's going on there? You've got a nerve that detects the stretch of like your stomach. You have all kinds of nerves down there. And what we see in people with I IBS is that there is a hypersensitivity to visceral sensory input. So there is like, let's say there's some, let's say here's your stomach. And after I eat whatever I'm gonna have for lunch, this is my stomach. If I am a healthy human being, this wide stomach makes me feel content. Oh man, I'm gonna unbutton that top button. I'm going to slap my belly. I'm going to eat one more piece of pie. I'm going to squeeze in that pie. Man, that's some good eating. Let me tell you what. That is some good eating. Mm. Delicious. Give me some of that peach cobble. A, a scoop of that, that a la mode vanilla ice cream. Mm, mm, mm. I can do one more. This makes us feel good. If you have a hypersensitivity to visceral sensory input, then this feels good bad. Oh, crap. I'm going to throw up. Oh, crap. Oh, my God. I ate too much. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I'm going to throw up. Oh, shit. This feels so bad. Like, oh, my God. I don't, something's, something's not right. This feels bad. So the way that your nerves are wired feels bad. Now, why are your wor nerves wired in this different way? If you had a parent who had GI problems, they were like constantly like talking about their own stomach. My stomach is messed up or whatever. Maybe there was some psychological need, right? When you, when your stomach, if you have a parent with GI problems and you complain, my stomach hurts and your parent takes that very seriously. It's not about just psychological needs reinforcement. It's like your parent is like, okay, so tell me, does it hurt? Is it bloated? Are you nauseous? Do you feel distended? Is it irritable? And so then they hyper-focus on that. And just like any parent will teach their child what they know, this is what happens. Right? So if I like, I, like, I like to meditate. And I'm a psychiatrist. So when my kids tell me that they're not feeling well, I ask them all kinds of questions about it. And I'm sort of leveling up their awareness about emotions. And if I ask all kinds of physical questions, then the kid is like, if I ask a six-year-old, do you feel distended or bloated? Do you feel nauseous? Do you feel gassy? 
do you have this problem? Do you have this problem? Literally what that's going to do is that six-year-old brain, is gonna, the attention is going to go into the gut. And their visceral sensory afferent nerves, which is the stuff that detects stuff in the gut, is going to become hypersensitive. This is the same way that, you know, if, if I teach a child how to cook, their palate is going to be sensitive, right? Same thing is going on in the gut. So what we know with kids with IBS is that their visceral internal input has become hypersensitive. This is because of the way that their parents treat them. This is because they do have some kind of real GI problem. This can also be because there's some kind of behavioral reinforcement where the only time my parents love me is when I like, like the only, like my parents ignore me. They're working really hard unless I get sick. And if I get sick, I get my parents' attention. Now, some people will interpret that as, oh, that means that this is, they're doing it for intention. What I'm saying is that that's just one piece of the puzzle. But at the end of the day, what ends up happening is our visceral sensory input increases. It changes the way that we experience ordinary things. Ordinary things become unpleasant. Okay? Now, combine that with active immune system and an allergic GI tract, and there's more crap going on. The more crap there is going on, if I amplify the signal, the worse everything gets. Y'all with me? How like all this stuff like fits together? There isn't like a linear, it's not a linear problem. It's like a system problem. And if y'all are curious about, you know, what is the system? This is the system. Like, look at this. What the fuck? This is literally how it works. People have mapped this out. This is not in your head. This is not psychological. There is a GI-specific anxiety. Absolutely. There's a personality component, but there's an attentional component. There is interoceptive conditioning. There's GI immune function, mechanoreceptors, afferent nerves, mechanical GI uh, stimulation. There are hormones that are acting here. This is like literally what we know. It is not in your head. Okay? So what I'm going to try to do is we're going to explain all this crap. So strap in, folks. We're just getting started. Okay? Y'all with me so far? Do you have any insight into idiopathic postpandrial syndrome? No. But by the end of this lecture, you will. Okay? I know it sounds kind of weird. All right. So this is IBS. All right? So what happens in IBS? Let's summarize. Something goes on early in life that primes our adrenaline and sympathetic nervous system. Something goes on in life that increases our sensory awareness of the GI system. That combined with stuff like catastrophizing from too much noradrenaline and bad things actually happening results in we get too much signal and we amplify the danger of the signal and we get screwed every th time anything happens. So what does this mean? This means that an IBS person can sit in some posture that makes their stomach feel slightly uncomfortable. And whereas a normal person would just shift and they'd be fine, the IBS person has all of this experience and their brain is functioning in a particular way to where this thing is not a benign problem. This ain't just going to go away. It's going to screw the rest of my day. Okay, that's IBS. Next thing we're going to talk about. POTS. When I'm laying down. I have about 300 to 800 milliliters of blood in my thorax, in my central chest, right? So when I'm laying down, there's no gravitational effect, and blood actually pools in my chest and abdomen. When I sit up, gravity has an effect on blood, pools towards the bottom. Then what happens is my body squeezes my blood, press, uh, blood vessels especially at the bottom of my feet. Okay, so here's our body when we're laying flat. Here's blood, equally distributed. Then when I sit up, here's my blood vessel. So what happens? Gravity makes it pool over here. How do I get the blood to move up? I clamp down this way. Right? So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a tube like this. And if I make a tube like this, what's going to happen with the blood? It's going to go up. With me? So there's another thing. So anytime we sit up or stand up, okay, we'll talk about 
Well, POTS is port postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. We'll talk about that in a second, all right? So you all have to understand this. The other thing that happens is notice that what I did here, I didn't just compress this, I also dilated this. So this is wider than this. And this is narrower than this. That's exactly what we want. So normally, when we sit up, the blood flow to our brain, we get dilation of the blood vessels that go into our brain. And we get constriction of the blood vessels at the bottom of our feet. And so what that means is that we're decreasing the resistance up here. Hey, blood, come on up to the, the head, bro. Come on, girl, like come up to the head and like give us cerebral blood flow so that we don't fucking pass out. And y'all feet, now that y'all have gravity working for you, y'all don't need as much blood, so we're going to constrict the blood vessels. Okay? This is the homeostasis that we sort of get with blood pressure. Now, what happens in POTS? In POTS, when people stand up, their blood pressure drops and they become tachycardic. So what happens is that when, when this happens with people with POTS, this does not actually happen. Instead, the blood vessels stay like this. And when the blood vessels stay like this, our brain, which is over here, is like, yo, I ain't getting no blood. I ain't getting no blood. So then that goes over to our heart, and our heart is like, oh, crap. Our brain ain't getting no blood. I'm going to start. That's a lightning bolt. I'm going to start beating really fast. So now I'm going to beat at 130 beats per minute. Okay? Why? Why am I beating at 130 be beats per minute? Because if I ain't getting no blood, I got to start pumping, right? The heart's got to pump because that's what maintains your vascular pressure is your heart. If your heart starts pumping, the pressure in your system basically drops to zero. I mean, that's not technically correct because there's fluid in there, but it's basically what maintains blood pressure, right? So this is what happens in POTS. People stand up and they feel dizzy. So, what causes this? So the first thing that I want to point out to y'all. So here is the symptoms associated with POTS in the relative frequency in 152 patients. Now, y'all may be asking yourselves, but Dr. K, you're talking about this is very physiologic. Like, there's no, there's no mind stuff here, right? So holy crap, POTS is associated with nausea in 38% of people. What the hell does that have to do with blood pressure? Diarrhea in 17% of people, fatigue in 48% of people, sleep disturbance in 31% of people, weakness, right? Like low MMR in 50% of people. Holy crap. Bronze rank in 50% of people. Palpitations, like that makes sense. That's heart stuff. Lightheadedness, dizziness, chest pain. I also wonder, does this look like symptoms of anxiety? Interesting, right? But if we look at evidence-based treatment, water and salt, fludrocortisone, exercise, midadrine, beta blockers, octreotide, erythropoietin, central sympho so lim uh, sympatholytic agents, right? So if we look at, like, treatments for POTS, like, no one is, like, what? But what about all this crap? What are we doing about this? What is the doctor going to do about this? And this is why patients have such frustrating experiences with doctors. Because when you get POTS, they send you a cardiologist, and cardiologist is like, great. I'm not trying to crap on cardiologists here. It's not their fault. They're like, I'm going to give you midadrine and fl fludrocortisone. Right? Because that's what cardiologists, I'm going to give you a beta blocker. I'm going to give you octreotide. But, like, they don't know anything about processing trauma. So what's up with that? So let's talk about trauma and stuff. You guys with me? So this is, first we have to understand how POTS works. That's basic understanding of POTS. All right? Now we're going to go into more details. We're going to go back to this. We're filling this out. Okay? All right. So let's understand a couple of things. So... If we look at, uh, and by the way, POTS also has a comorbidity with chronic fatigue syndrome of 48%. All right, so that's kind of interesting. Like, what does chronic fatigue have to do with this stuff? So let's understand a couple of things about impaired blood flow.
So what we know in POTS is that there is a paradoxical vasoconstriction. I know I'm tossing terms at you. We're going to explain it, okay? Of cerebral blood flow. Now, what does that mean? This is the normal situation. When we stand up, this is what we want, right? So here's normal. Here's what we want. And what happens in POTS? This. Right? So this is where the blood flow is normally. When we sit up, we get this. And what happens in people with POTS? This. So paradoxical. Why do we call it a paradox? Because it's the opposite of what's supposed to happen. Vasoconstriction. So this is vasoconstriction. We are constricting the blood vessel towards the brain. So when their brain should be getting blood, they don't get blood. In fact, they get even less blood. And now we see why presyncope means almost passing out is 60% of people. They're right before passing out. They also pass out, by the way. But like 60% of people regularly almost pass out or feel lightheaded or dizzy because there's no blood flow. Now you may say, but Dr. K, what the F does this have to do with the mind? So what causes this paradoxical vasoconstriction? What do we know about people with POTS? Is they have a dysregulation of their sympathetic nervous system. And this is adrenaline and noradrenaline. And have we heard of that before, chat? Huh. That's interesting. So even GI stuff that is completely unrelated, we will see in all of these psychosomatic illnesses are going to have Changes, where, where is this? Where did I, I put this somewhere, right? Yeah. They're going to have hyperactivation of the sympathetic, a problem with reuptake of noradrenaline in IBS. And we get a problem with our sympathetic nervous system in POTS, which is responsible for a lot of that crap. So that's interesting, Dr. K. You're telling me that dysregulation of the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for IBS, and this is a problem in POTS, if that were true, then that would mean that someone with POTS may have problems with their GI tract. Holy crap! 40% of people with POTS have problems with their GI tract. I wonder if there is a common mechanism. Yes. Yes, there is. Oh, that's fucking weird. It's almost like POTS is not a cardiovascular problem and is actually relates to GI issues, and IBS may not be a GI issue and may relate to your cardiovascular system. It's almost as if the body is connected. Yes, that is precisely correct. Okay? Now, what else do we have with POTS? We have abnormal visceral sensory input. So people with POTS are hypersensitive, not to their GI tract, although they may do that too because they experience bloating and all that crap. They are hypersensitive to the, the signals from their heart. So these, think about it this way. The neurons that connect to the heart have the volume jacked all the way up. So even a tiny little signal gets amplified in our brain. And we're going to get to this more with fibromyalgia in a second. Okay? So... Now, here's a question for you. So th there's also one other thing. So this paradoxical vasoconstriction is caused by hypocapnia, low CO2. Okay, now, this is, now we're going to get kind of crazy and we're going to get into a really interesting detail. So when we've got a blood vessel, what determines whether it dilates or what determines whether it constricts. Actually, I want to redo that. Let me do this. Okay. So, here's our blood vessel. This is a dilated blood vessel. This is a constricted blood vessel. When we have 
high CO2 or low O2, our blood vessels will expand, right? Because we're not getting enough blood. What does blood do? It carries oxygen and it gets rid of CO2. So when we've got high CO2, i.e. and low oxygen, that's when our blood vessels are like, hey, let's dilate. We need more blood. When we have low CO2 or high O2, then our blood vessels constrict. So this is our, our body's way of, so I'll give you all just a simple example of this, okay? So let's say I'm running. Now, what happens to my blood vessels when I'm running? It's not uniform. So my GI system is like, or our skeletal muscles are doing a lot of activity. My legs are pounding. As my legs contract, as the muscles in my legs contract, they're doing work, right? So they're consuming a lot of oxygen. So that O2 level by the, the legs drops. As the O2 level by the legs drops, our blood vessels expand near the legs. So that's how we get more blood flow to the legs, right? Get the heart pumping. Now, what's happening in your GI system when you go running? GI system ain't doing crap. It's not digesting anything. So it's like, hey, like the, the skeletal muscle is like, hey, we need a bunch of oxygen. We need more blood. Our GI system is like, we're running on an empty stomach. We're not digesting anything. We don't need any blood. So they constrict. Now, what happens in POTS is a paradoxical vasoconstriction. So even though the tissue in the blood in the brain doesn't have enough oxygen, right? We're not getting enough blood. For some reason, there's vasoconstriction. And so what we know in people with POTS is that if you can induce hypercapnia, if you can increase CO2 levels, it will actually fix this screwed up vasoconstriction in your brain. So people with POTS are hypocapnic, which means that they cause, there's some kind of weird paradoxical hypocapnia, which causes vasoconstriction. So one of the treatments for POTS, I know this sounds kind of weird, is actually to increase your CO2 level, okay? Because remember, when we increase our CO2 level, what happens? We vasodilate. What do we want to blood? What What do we want for blood flow in the brain? We want to vasodilate our blood to the brain. We want to go from here to here. And what is the signal that goes from this to this? It is increased CO2. I know I kind of stumbled through that. Do you all? Get me? Y'all with me now? So when CO2 increases, we're going to vasodilate. Okay? Now, if only there was a practice that we could do that would induce high levels of CO2. Do y'all know of any such practice? Which is weird, right? Because we don't usually think about it as high levels of CO2. Making out actually works. Yes, I'm sure that would work. Meditation. Yes, 100%, right? So we're going to get to that in a second when we talk about how to fix this stuff and why people kept on coming to me to fix their psychosomatic illnesses, okay? So in POTS, we've got basically all the same stuff, right? So we've got abnormal sensory processing. We've got hyperactivation of the sympathetic nervous system, and there's some weird specific physiologic stuff that is we're tunneling way down into, okay? We got to understand how nerves work. This is really important to understand for psychosomatic illness, okay? So, y'all ever heard of phantom limb? So phantom limb is when someone has an amputation. And for the limb that has been amputated, they still feel pain in the amputated limb even though there's no nerve there to feel pain. And this is a problem, right? Because I am a medical doctor and I can give someone some kind of treatment to provide analgesia to the pain. Analgesia means the removement of removing pain, okay? So I can like give you a medicine to like dull the nerves or I can give you something like lidocaine. So lidocaine numbs nerves. It shuts off nerves. And if I give you lidocaine, then you won't feel any pain because I've shut off the nerve. But how on earth is a doctor, what do I do if there's no nerve to begin with and you're feeling pain? It's like, wait, what? How do I, what, what's going on there? So let's understand. Here's my hand. Okay. My hand has 
receptors. So I want y'all to do this with me. Poke yourself. When you poke yourself, you feel something, right? So when you feel this, what's happening is there's a nerve over here that's detecting that. That nerve travels all the way up your arm and enters into the side of your spinal cord, joins with a bunch of other nerves. So it like there's a new nerve over here. So I'm going to send a signal over here. And then I transmit that signal to a nerve over here. A second un uh, connected nerve, but it's a different nerve, goes into my brain, makes a second connection, and then travels to another part of my brain. And then in that third nerve is where I experience pain. Okay? The central, the subjective experience of pain doesn't come from your hand. It comes from your brain. Okay? So here's nerve number one. Nerve number two. And nerve number three. So if I get a signal that travels down here and then activates over here and travels down here and activates over here, then I feel pain. Now, when we have phantom limb... There's nothing over here. But what can sometimes happen is this can get stuck in the on position. And if this gets stuck in the on position or this gets stuck in the on position, then we will subjectively feel pain because our switch up here is stuck on, even though there's no, it's not coming from anywhere. Does that make sense? It can get stuck on. So even if you look at things like tinnitus or tinnitus, what happens in tinnitus? We are hearing something, but there's no noise. So normally when we hear things, there's auditory nerve number one, auditory nerve number two, and auditory nerve number three. But there's no sound. So this thing isn't activating, but this guy over here in tinnitus, this is probably what it is, somehow still like screws up and turns on. So what is fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is something over here where we're not quite sure, but there's a part of it that's peripheral and there's a part of it that's central. So in fibromyalgia, people feel pain all over the place, okay? So some of that is coming from the out, like some of that is coming from the peripheral nerve. Some of it is actually coming from my hands, but some of it is also coming from my brain. So there is a abnormal signal and central processing. Now, what are some of the things that contribute to this? So we know that people with fibromyalgia oftentimes have some low level of an inflammatory activity. Now, what is inf inflammation? Do you all know what the relationship between inflammation and pain is? So inflammation makes our pain receptors hypersensitive. So when I have an injury... I don't want to re-traumatize the injury, right? Like if I have a broken bone, I don't want to screw up the healing of the bone. So evolutionarily, what am I going to do? I'm going to send signals to my brain, hey, don't touch this. And anytime, even a light touch on a broken bone will hurt a lot. And that's adaptive because if I don't, if any touch hurts, then I'm not going to move it. And if I don't move it, then it has a better chance to heal properly. Whereas if I've got a cut on my hand and I keep on, if I have no pain signals, then like that cut is going to keep getting infected and I'm going to like use it and it's going to open up more. It's going to be more damaging. So it is adaptive for inflammation to increase pain. In fibromyalgia, there's some, some level of inflammation that is like low grade going on in the body. And by the way, what are some of the things that contribute to whole brain, I mean, whole body inflammation? gut microbiome okay so what contributes to whole body inflammation our allergic load right so if we've got hypersensitive things like mast cells and crap like that that's going to increase inflammation what are allergies allergies are inappropriate activation of immune system and i don't know if you all know this but Inflammation is caused by the immune system. The two are basically interchangeable. Inflammation is the activity of the immune system. And gut microbiome is one of the biggest sources of um, like kind of whole body low-level inflammation. There are even studies that show that low-level inflammation in the brain leads to mood disorders. Okay? So we were really, really excited about this. And we're like, oh, inflammation leads to mood disorders, so let's give 
people who are de depressed, anti-inflammatory medications. But doesn't really help much, unfortunately. And this is, and hopefully you all understand why, because you can't just target one part of this. Do you all get this? It's all friggin' connected. And it's not like there's one problem. Okay? So in the case of fibromyalgia, we have abnormal nervous input. We have low-level inflammation. There are even studies that show that gut-brain interventions will be helpful for fibromyalgia. So let's go to... So here's a, just a, good, a better graphical representation than me. So here's the trauma. Here's the peripheral nerve. Travels to the spinal cord. Has ascending input into the brain. And then we have, we have a transmission of pain signal into the brain. I'm going to pause for a second and ask y'all what questions do y'all have about what we've covered so far. So next up is like what the hell to do about it. And we're going to pull it all together. But before we do that, I want to, oh, I want to make sure that y'all, oh crap. I want to make sure that y'all have a chance to ask questions. So the first question that I, that people ask. So now we're going to pull it together. Y'all ready? Bringing it all together as well as like how I approach patients who have this problem. So the first thing to understand about Western medicine is that Western medicine is based on linear idiopathogenic principles. What does that mean? Linear, A leads to B, idiopathogenic. The source of the problem is linear. So in Western medicine, what causes a heart attack? It implies that there's this thing called a heart attack and it has a cause. So what causes a heart attack is the basically absolute occlusion of a coronary artery. This is the problem that causes this thing. What causes COVID? A virus causes COVID, right? What causes depression? Major depressive disorder is caused by a serotonin deficiency. Now, that's not necessarily true, but my point is, if you look at Western medicine, it is like A leads to B, which is how our system of science works. So in science, what we try to do in medicine, we do these things called randomized controlled trials, which is we're going to remove all of the other factors, and we are going to try to isolate the relationship between A and Z. This is literally how we build our scientific infrastructure. So the more complicated it is, we try to actually remove all of that crap. And so what we've done in Western medicine is get really, really good at treating things where an A leads to a Z. We get really, really good at the treatment of a specific diagnosis. And that's how our system of medicine is structured. You get a diagnosis and you go to the expert that deals with that diagnosis. Now, this creates all kinds of problems. One of my favorite quotes from an anime is, over-specialize and breed in weakness from Ghost in the Shell. And so now, for example, we know that gut health is very important for mood disorders. We know that there's some kind of gut bacteria that endogenously produce serotonin. And when people have a mood disorder, those kinds of gut bacteria are low in number. So we have the wrong gut bacteria to produce serotonin. So we have a serotonin, an endogenous serotonin deficiency. If we send you to a psychologist, who has had a total of zero hours of training on anything related to the gut, they are not going to be able to help you with that. We can send you to a psychiatrist. We know some of the stuff, right? So the, one of the reasons that we're decent is we know some of the medical stuff. But even in our system of psychiatry, we don't really, like, apply it. If we send you to a cardiologist, like, they're going to know the cardiac stuff, but they're not going to know about trauma. But trauma and POTS are related. And this has to do with our lineo idiopathogenic perspective in medicine. One thing causes one problem. As our system of medicine has evolved, we have started to discover other things. So cardiac disease, sure, is what causes a heart attack is a clogged artery. But what we also know is that your cholesterol level over the course of your lifespan will lead to occlusion of the artery. That this thing matters more and this thing matters more and this thing matters more, right? So then what happens in our Western system of medicine so here is a heart attack caused by a occlusion of a coronary artery. And then what are the risk factors that lead to a coronary occlusion? 
cholesterol, inflammation. Okay, well, what is what uh, determines cholesterol? Exercise, diet, genetics. Okay, what leads to inflammation? Like everything. Diet, <laughs> genetics, gut microbiome. Y'all with me? And so Western medicine is just an absolute beast for some things. Like cystic fibrosis. Man, this is friggin' amazing. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a single gene mutation. There ain't risk factors and stuff. If you've got two copies of the recessive gene, you're screwed. And so if we replace this gene, the cystic fibrosis goes away. There are some kinds of cancer, uh, like CML, for example. I think this is right, right? Well, we sort of figured out like an antibody. We figured out one thing where we can like basically, uh, is it CML? I feel like I'm blanking here. But there's all kinds of stuff. There's like HER2 new positive cancers and HER2 new negative cancers. And then we're really good at stuff like microbiology and infectious disease. We like crush all of the systems of medicine when it comes to this. You've got a bug in you. The bug causes a problem. We are going to give you an antibiotic that's going to kill the bug and the problem will literally disappear. You will be cured. We can, hopefully soon, we can cure cystic fibrosis. There's some diseases in medicine that we can cure. Which of the diseases we can cure? The ones that have a linear etiopathogenesis. We can't cure all of them, but we sort of figure it out. Now, the more that a disease moves away from this concept, the worse we get at Western medicine. If you have IBS, your PCP is going to send you to a cardiol or GI doctor and a psychotherapist, and they're going to each act independently. Okay? But... There's no uniform thing. And why isn't there a uniform thing? Because there's so much crap to learn over here. So when I literally have a patient with psychosomatic illness, this is what I do with them. Okay? So the first thing is we know that there's some genetic predispositions. What do we do about it? Nothing. Can't really do much about it. Right? So I don't do gene therapy in my office. But for you to understand that Part of this is genetic, but then you may say, but doc Dr. K, like, then what's the point of talking about it? So this is why I talk to my patients about karma. We'll get to this later. All right. But to understand that as a human being, there is a narrative and a reason for you being the way that you are. And there is a therapeutic modality to kind of like talk to people about this stuff. And when I talk to my patients about their karma, it helps them make sense of their real of their life. It gives them a sense of narrative. Narrative, so karma leads to narrative. And narrative heals trauma. This is scientific. This is not. Second thing, social factors. So there's a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. The first is, I know it's kind of weird, but what is your relationship with illness? And this may sound kind of weird because how is that like a social factor? Like, I, I don't know how else to put this. But when you were raised, it helps to understand how you were socialized. So, like, if your stomach hurts, what did you learn about life? How did other people treat you? What was reinforced and not reinforced? Because what's happening is that oftentimes the wrong things are reinforced in our upbringing. And then we propagate those things. So one example of this is overvalued ideas and catastrophizing. So what this means is that, and there's also like social consequences. So if my stomach rumbles, that means that I'm screwed. That means that I can't have fun today. That means that I need to leave, which then leads to social isolation. So this, all this crap is like you have to unpack. Right? Because every time, because you have to understand that your 
your body is has visceral afferents that are hypersensitive, which means that you may technically be completely fine. But the way that you are wired is to amplify a normal signal into the danger zone. And then you have behaviors once you enter the danger zone. So this is something that I also have to help people with who are like actively psychotic. And when you're actively psychotic and there is a devil trying to break down your door, you are getting a danger signal that leads to a behavior. Since the devil is trying to break down the door, I better jump out the window. Problem is you're on a third story of a building. And I literally had a patient who did that, broke both of their legs. So part of my treatment for this patient is the signals that you are receiving, there needs to be space between the signals that you receive and what you do. Okay, this goes back to this. Where do we create that space? This is where we create that space. Between the stressor and the response, there needs to be space. Okay, so if you're someone who struggles with psychosomatic illness, and this is what CBT does as well. So if we look at this, this is going to be CBT. CBT will teach you, train you to create a space between your visceral afferent information and your behaviors and all this kind of stuff in the middle. So the other thing that we need to do, and this is all, okay, so upbringing factors. So this is all where, you know, this is where we kind of think about parental reinforcement. When you were sick, what did it do for various parts of your life? Right, you need to think about that. Did it, did it give you, were you excused from duties. And if that's the case, then some part of your mind is going to have figured that out, right? And then what's going to happen is when you feel stressed and things are overwhelming and you need, you wish stuff would go away, you will get sick. Now, why are you getting sick? Are you trying to get out of responsibility? A part of you is, but that doesn't mean that what you feel is not real. Right? That also means that when you're stressed, your cortisol levels are going to increase. The inflammation is going to increase. We're going to see noradrenaline dumping into your system, and it's going to physiologically create all these problems as well. It is neither either or. It is psychosomatic. And this is what we know. So people who have psychogenic seizures, which are like fake seizures, 50% of them or more have real seizures as well. So our mind is going to learn to use whatever fucking tools it has at its disposal. And that can include your own illness, your very real physiologic illness to get excuses from stress. Because your mind, it's not even a getting an excuse. That's the wrong way. It's a way to remove stress. Our brain is like, hey, we've got too much stress. We can play this card and it'll make the stress go away. We're going to play that card because it's too overwhelming. Trauma. So when we get traumatized, we become alexithymic. We dissociate. And then we have a problem because we've got a stressor, which, by the way, is a amplified visceral afferent, right? We've got a hypersensitive nerve, which then travels to our brain and then is perceived by our mind and then induces physiologic changes. Increased adrenaline. Increased cortisol. And by the way, I don't know if you all know this, but cortisol increases inflammation. And as we've learned, what do these things do? We have visceral afferent hypersensitivity. So our tissues react to that. Our heart starts pumping faster. Inflammation in the gut. Right? So remember that IBS is caused by allergy of the gut, hyperactivation of inflammation. So when we get inflammation in the gut, our gut starts to feel weird. We get inflammation, increases visceral afferent. We stress ourselves out, goes back to the brain. It's a cycle. Now remember, this goes back to Freud, so we got to thank the dude for a couple of things. One of the things that he discovered is that once we make the unconscious conscious, we can act upon it. So as we become less alexithymic, so right now what's going on is that this is just passing straight through. But once we raise awareness of this, we can utilize our mind to dampen the signal. So 
So as you become emotionally aware, literally that stress does not pass straight through to your physiology. This is why psychotherapy helps with psychosomatic illness. It is not that, I hopefully I've convinced y'all at this point, the problem is all of this. Why does psychosomatic, why does psychotherapy works? It's because we can interrupt the cycle in one place. But psychotherapy does not cure psychosomatic illness. It just helps because we're utilizing this. And someone else, like let's say a, cardio, a cardiologist may give you something to reduce the effect of uh, adrenaline, like a beta blocker. Okay? So we can intervene at every one of these places. And it just happens that psychotherapy is one of them. The problem is that our physiologic understanding of all of this stuff sucks. And so our medical doctors are not able to intervene in these global holistic ways. And so like since this sucks, we don't have a good treatment for it, which is why they get sent to a psychologist and a psychologist can consistently help these people. Therefore, we conclude it is psychological in nature. It is not psychological in nature. But your mind is a tool that you can use to modulate the signals between your stressors and your responses. Do we understand this? Is psychosomatic the same as autoimmune? It's really freaking close, but it is not the same. Okay, what the hell is this? How do I get rid of this? I don't even know. What is this? Oh God. Okay, great. Next up, reducing inflammation, right? So anti-inflammatory diet. Okay. So actually we're gonna move that. I'll talk about this at the end. Let's talk about inflammation and gut together. Now we're going to teach you some cool stuff. The other thing that we've got to do is reprogram our physiology and nervous system. How are we going to do this? Mind, body, practices. Things like meditation and especially yoga. So how do you reprogram your brain, your physiology, and your nervous system? Yoga and Tai Chi are like the best. So let's understand this. So in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which is sort of like the seminal text on yoga, the Bible of yoga, call it whatever you want. When he talks about yoga postures or yoga asan, he doesn't write like a whole book, right? There are whole books on yoga postures. Like, can I find it on my shelf? Yes. Dr. K actually organized his bookshelf. You have books like the Hatha Yoga Pradipika which is a text on yoga. It's all about the different postures, all the different asanas that you've got, right? Let's see if there's pictures. There's like this kind of crap where this dude is candle gazing. There's this kind of crap where there's like dude pouring water in his nose. There's like this kind of crap, this posture. Let's find another picture. Oh my God, pictures. Where, there's this kind of crap, right? This is Hatha Yoga Pradipika. All of these are asanas. But all of these things come from Patanjali saying that there are two things that make a yoga asan, yoga posture. It should be stable and it should bring your awareness to the present. So when you do yoga, what's literally happening in your brain? And the original research that I did was in a somatosensory, in a neuroscience lab studying the somatosensory cortex on Tai Chi at Harvard. And what we basically discovered is that when you do yoga, you enter this human pretzel. Why do you turn in this human pretzel? It's not about flexibility. Everyone's like, oh, I want to do yoga for flexibility. That's not why anyone does. I mean, that's why it's stupid. No, not stupid. That's judgmental. That's not what yoga is designed for. The purpose of yoga is to bring your sensory awareness to your body in the present. So the reason that I do this for a long time, why do we hold postures, is that the longer you hold a posture, and if you get that right kind of stretch, your attention goes to a particular part of your body. So literally, what are you remapping? This visceral sensory afferent, right? This is the term that we use. The nerves that detect things in your gut or in your heart. 
that are hypersensitized. When we do yoga and Tai Chi, we recalibrate those because what are you literally doing with your brain? What you're doing with your brain is focusing your attention on a particular thing away from a particular thing. You're literally, and this is what we sort of found in our lab, was you are remapping like that part of your brain, the somatosensory afferent part. It looks like I have a, something going on there, whatever. All right, I'm activated. I had coffee on an empty stomach today. That's probably why I have this going on. Hypersensitivity, skin reaction. Y'all are seeing it happen live because of my diet. That's <laughs> funny. So yoga and Tai Chi, what they're going to do is re, sort of recalibrate that sort of like sensory mapping, okay? And what I've sort of found when I have patients that consistently do yoga, their relationship to their body changes. And something just weird happens with your somatosensory cortex, it kind of rewires. And that signal of like afferent nerve into the brain changes. So the, the lab that I was in was studying chronic pain and Tai Chi. And what we sort of discovered was this thing that the, in chronic pain, our brain is sort of locked into pain in a particular way. And that Tai Chi actually like increases neuroplasticity in that part of our brain and reduces the chronic pain via neuroplasticity. So this is why if you look at studies on yoga and, and Tai Chi, they're superior to exercise when it comes to some of these things in terms of outcomes. The question is why? Because it's not just about pumping your brain. It is about your, I mean, start pumping your heart. It's about brain sensory attention and like rewiring that crap, which is what yoga and, med uh, and Tai Chi do. Now, there are a couple of other really interesting things with yoga and, and, and Tai Chi, which is that they also work on some of this, this business. So this stuff over here, right? Remember like our business about like the vasoconstriction and baroreceptors and all this kind of stuff. When we do yoga postures like handstands, and when we do these different kinds of postures, what happens is like we dilate and constrict different parts of our vasculature and breathing and like all that kind of stuff like rolls in there. And it somehow like recalibrates that stuff in the positive direction. So what I've observed clinically is that yoga and Tai Chi work on all of these different levels. So there's a sensory attentional component. There's a physiologic component. Like literally, if you think about Doing a headstand, what do you think that's doing to your cerebral blood flow? It is changing the way that it is changing the load of cerebral blood flow. And it's changing the way that your vasculature response, uh, responds to now you've got gravity moving in the opposite direction. If you've got gravity moving in the opposite direction, now your, your blood vessels need to adapt. Once your blood vessels adapt... You are changing this fixed pattern. Once you change this fixed pattern, we are breaking this cycle. Do you all get that? So one of the things that we know is that the key to healing, uh, this is my belief, the key to healing psychosomatic illness is re-engaging the adaptive systems of our body and brain. Our body is locked into a cycle and we need to break that cycle. We can do it mentally through psychotherapy, and we can do it physiologically. And stuff like a physiologic reprogramming, exercise helps too. The last thing that we're going to talk about is diet or brain gut and whole body inflammation. So what we know is that this leads to this, and this also leads to things like neurotransmitter precursors. And so by adapting our diets to be low inflammation and eat the right kind of things, and I actually think that, so this is going to be a less evidence-based recommendation, but I love Ayurvedic diet for this kind of stuff. So I think that if you look at it, it's kind of interesting. Earlier, I was a big, big fan of Ayurveda, and I said Ayurveda was great. And I pointed to a couple of scientific studies, which were actually very weak in their effect size. And people from our community were like, hey, this, this study isn't very good. So I, I reread the studies and I think the science behind Ayurveda is not there. But why do I believe in Ayurveda? So a couple of things. The first is that, remember, we're talking about the linear idiopathogenic idea from Western medicine. One thing causes, one problem causes one disease. Ayurveda is different. Ayurveda believes in systems. So Ayurveda and Chinese medicine do not think that one thing causes one disease. In fact, they think the exact opposite. 
that any problem is connected to all other problems. And that all these things over here connect to all of this stuff over here. So that's why for mental illness, they give things for the, the first, line, uh, first line Ayurvedic treatment is dietary change. And that's why if you look at Ayurvedic medicine, it's not medicine aimed to treat a disease. It is stuff like ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is in, in Ayurveda what's called a brain tonic. What does that mean? They're not trying to cure some problem in the brain. What they're trying to do is provide the brain with certain herbs that encourage healing or fix, they just promote the health of the brain. So what do we know about scientific studies of ashwagandha? Scientific studies of ashwagandha demonstrate that ashwagandha induces neuroplasticity. It allows your brain to rewire. Now, it doesn't fix a particular thing. It just allows you to rewire your brain. Now, in what way it rewires, it just it removes something from read only to edit mode. That's what ashwagandha does in the brain. And if you do that, what kind of benefits will you get? Will it help for trauma? Yeah. Will it help for chronic pain? Yeah. Will it help for anxiety? Yeah. But it is not a treatment for any of those things. And so the problem is that the way that we study Eastern medicine is from this linear idiopathogenic model. And the treatment, so if you go to an Ayurvedic doctor and you say, if a patient has anxiety, what would you give them? They'll say, I'll give them ashwagandha. If they've got dementia, what would you give them? I'll give them ashwagandha. If they've got chronic pain, what would you give them? I'll give them ashwagandha. But it's not a treatment for any of those things. Because in their model, their, their whole system is different. They think in terms of systems. And so from a diet standpoint, right? So you can use whatever evidence-based diet you want. High fiber, moderate amount of protein. I know a lot of people are intermittent fasting and ketosis and stuff like that. Jury's still out on that stuff, TBH, right? I think there's like a part of that that's a fad. But Ayurvedic diet, I think, is the best, personally. So this is not, and this is what I, I explain to my patients, that this is a recommendation. Here's the biological plausibility. There's an ethical component to recommending complementary alternative medicine. And it is to let people know, hey, there are not studies on this. This is why I believe it. Here's the biological plausibility. Here's what the science shows. Here's what the science doesn't show. It is your choice whether you want to engage in it or not. And generally speaking, the recommendations that I make from Ayurveda are more diet-related because there are some medicines in Ayurveda that are toxic. Like they'll give people arsenic and mercury as a part of their medical treatment. So I do not advocate for that. That's why I'm talking about dietary change, right? Because that's where like also there's like evidence-based reasons to recommend it. So usually Ayurvedic diets are also higher in fiber than the basic like American diet, for example. So they, 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 there's a lot of evidence-based components to it when I make, recommend, make diet recommendations. But the key thing about Ayurvedic diet is they won't say three servings of fruits and vegetables. They'll say that an apple is different from a mango in terms of what it'll do for your body or your brain. But I can make that recommendation. I feel really comfortable as a medical doctor because I explain to my patients that I say, either way, you're getting fruit. And here's the scientific benefits of fruit. There just may be an additional benefit to eating mangoes instead of apples. You want to give it a shot or not? Let's see whether it works for you or doesn't work for you. So when it comes to brain, gut, and inflammation, I think Ayurvedic diet is the best thing to do, personally, right? And that's what I use clinically. Now, if y'all are thinking about instituting dietary changes, you should absolutely talk to your doctor about it because there are other things to consider as well. So this is a long way of talking about if you've got psychosomatic illness, let's wrap up. First thing to understand is that it's psycho and somatic. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the nervous system with inflammation, with your particular tissues. There's absolutely a upbringing component. And when there is an upbringing component, we send you to psychiatry or psychology, right? Because we're the only ones that really deal with upbringing. So you absolutely need to understand the relationship between your body's signals and your life as a whole. When my body sends the signal, what does it mean to me? How do I make conclusions about it? Second thing we really need to do is improve alexithymia and integrate really our mind into this process. Because for most people who, are psycho who have psychosomatic problems, their mind is removed from the process. 
it's not that it's weak. It's that, or even that their mind is like, we blind ourselves to a part of it and then we push the rest through. And then that means that a stressor directly impacts our physiology without the mind being able to modulate it. So that's something you need to fix. So whether you want to work on alexithymia, we've got YouTube videos about that. We've got right in the feels about that. You want to see a psychotherapist. There's a lot of good benefits to psychotherapy for this kind of stuff. But then the next thing is literally like neuroplasticity kind of stuff. It's re restructuring your physiology, restructuring your, your neuroplasticity so that this cycle gets affected. And mind-body practices, there's like, you know, studies that show that Tai Chi is effective for fibromyalgia, right? So I, you can make that recommendation like pretty squarely. And we know that yoga and fibromyalgia and stuff are going to help. I mean, sorry, yoga and meditation are going to help. So meditation will help too. Exercise will help too. Diet will help too. And now some of y'all may be saying, and what kind of diet? So, you know, y'all can check out Dr. K's guide. We go into more detail about a lot of like, if y'all are interested in in a lot of these systems, you'll get more understanding of it through things like Dr. K's guide. But we don't necessarily focus on that. It's just our perspective on mental health in the mind involves these perspectives, right? So when we have, for example, like when we talk about anxiety in our anxiety guide, there's a whole lecture on the physiology of anxiety and meditation practices that harness that physiology. So that if you're trying to conquer anxiety, it is not purely to be conquered in the mind. It is to be conquered through inflammation. It is to be conquered through the brain. It is through, to be conquered through physiology. And it is to be conquered through the mind. So the other difference is that when I look at mental illness, I do not think of it as mental. It, all mental illness is psychosomatic. All physical illness is psychosomatic. All illness is psychosomatic. If if all illness was not psychosomatic, placebo would not exist. The mind has the capacity. In 1873, there was a French psychiatrist, I believe, who wrote this book called Essays de Physiologie Philosophique. Butcher the French pronunciation. In this... He had a ward of like 80 patients or something, 83 patients, something like that. I forgot the exact number. Bra goes in there and gives them all some medicine, gives them whatever medicine they have. Then he goes back 15 minutes later and he says, oh my God, I have given you the wrong medicine. I don't I can't do a French accent. He says, I've given you something that will induce vomiting and is to be given to patients after they ingest poison to get the poison out of their body. This was back before the days where we had ethical boards, where you can't do this kind of crap to people. 80% of them started vomiting. Oh no, there's a problem with our camera. So he, so this, this French doctor tells him that it's going to induce vomiting, and 80% of them vomit. So all illness is psychosomatic, because the mind is integrated into the rest of the body. And so if you all really want to conquer this stuff, you must educate yourself in all of these systems because the basic weakness in our system of medicine, there's some PCPs, by the way, that are really good at this stuff. They've basically become psychosomatic specialists. Is that there's like, it's like trans organ system. So it's like lots of different organ systems rolled into one. And why did I get good at it? Because everyone's like psychotherapy works. But psych just because psychotherapy works doesn't mean that it's mental. It just means that the mind can have an effect. So what I strongly recommend that y'all do, first of all, don't give up hope. The reason that crap doesn't work is because we haven't understood this stuff. It doesn't mean that the disease is not treatable or that even you can theor theoretically be cured. So instead, what you really got to do is leverage everything that you've got. Right? You have to work on all of these levels, on the gut microbiome level. And I've had patients, by the way, that have had really great PCPs that did really weird stuff. Like, I don't recommend this, but, you know, the guy did something off-label, which is he gave a course of antibiotics, busted up my patient's gut bacteria, and then gave them a very specific course of probiotics. And basically went, like, nuclear on the gut bacteria and then repopulated, rapid expanded into the space. And this patient had IBS for like 15 years and has not had symptoms since, right? But then you also have to maintain good diet and stuff to keep your gut bacteria healthy. 
but there's all kinds of stuff out there. So don't give up hope and use as many of these mechanisms as you can, whether it's mental and going, going to see a psychotherapist. And by the way, we didn't talk about psycho, I mean, pharmacology, but pharmacology can absolutely be helpful as well, right? So we showed, for example, that nature review, which showed that beta blocker, blockers can help, octreotide can help, like all these different kinds of medicines can help. The problem is that they're going to fix one piece of that. So all that stuff is good. And it's not even like, uh, and this is what I'm saying, is that there's a fundamental problem with the way that we practice Western medicine, which doesn't make it the cardiologist's fault, right? It's not that your cardiologist is bad or anything. They're great, but they're really good at doing what they're good at. Like, it's what it's like, we may not be very good at psychosomatic illness, but you can literally like, and we can take your heart out of your body and give you a new one. You can have completely non-functioning kidneys and we can hook up you up to an artificial kidney three times a week and keep you alive for like 15 years. So we're really good at what we're good at. It's in these non-linear idiopathogenic diseases that Western medicine really struggles. But the other thing that I want you all to think about is everything that I've been able to teach you today. I'm not talking to you about doshas and energy and, you know, prana and all this kind of stuff. Everything I'm talking to you all about today is science, right? Where did I learn all this stuff? This is, this is all like, this is good stuff, man. Like, we have lots of cool studies. We're finally figuring out, Western science is figuring all this stuff out, that it's more complicated than we thought. And this is where you're going to say, but Dr. K, you're just basically saying yoga, meditation, diet, go see your doctor, and exercise is the answer? Yes. But that's what everyone says to do. That's what everyone says to do because it works. The problem, what I sort of find when I explain this stuff is people don't understand how it works. Right? They're like, exercise feels bad. And everyone's trying to exercise because y'all want to exercise so that you can look fit. No one's exercising to reprogram your internal physiology and fix paradoxical vasoconstriction. If you want to fucking look fit and impress people, take a picture and apply a filter. The rest of the internet is doing it anyway. If you want to rewire your, your brain and your physiology, then do exercise, yoga, and meditation. Not for fucking likes on Instagram. Understand that if you want to heal your body, you have to heal your body. What kind of answer are you looking for? Are you looking for a pill to take? Looking for a pill to take or one thing to do to fix all of your problems is what Western medicine excels at and what got us into this problem in the first place. It's not your fault that you were abused or traumatized or become alexithymic or your karma or whatever. But this is the body and mind and brain that you live with today. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Because unfortunately, my profession has dropped the ball. We have tons of patients who go to doctors and doctors don't take them seriously. My symptoms are real. I feel bloated all the time. The doctor's like, I don't know what to do about that. Go see a therapist. It's very demeaning. And also, we don't know what to do about that because that's not how we're trained. We can try this medicine. We can try this medicine. Well, medicine ain't going to fix it. The stuff, uh, this, I mean, hopefully that'll change one day. I'm optimistic. Medicine's going to help. But it ain't like cystic fibrosis where you can replace the gene and everything will happen. Right? There's some, it's not like antibiotics. Like there's some stuff that is whole body. And, and as doctors, some, like I said, there's some PCPs that are really good at this. But generally speaking, we're not good at whole body medicine. So good luck.